Questions, comments, critiques, challenge me. <laughs> yes. So, um, your first question, how did the Venezuelan leadership allow this? Well, this is an occupation by invitation. Um, so I think a lot of things happen. You get a leadership that has participated in the plunder of its own country, okay? So that, you know, they created loyalty. I describe it in the book. Um, how did this happen? Uh, a lot of it has to do with human nature, I think, too. And, you know, of course, I can't get into it in the book. But I think the way that it was done, it's like, how did Fidel Castro institute a totalitarian system in Cuba? You know, how did he turn, for example, the fight against the Batista regime that was going to restore Cuba to, to democracy in the Constitution of 1940? So that we could spend a lot of hours analyzing how people fall for those populist, you know, governments. And also the model, I describe in the chapter in Venezuela, for example, some of the things were implemented in Venezuela that were implemented in Cuba. Like the military doctrine was changed to la guerra de todo el pueblo, the war of all peoples, the militarization of society, the colectivo. I mean, this is like... It's very sophisticated, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of Venezuelans probably didn't catch on until very late in the game. There were very few that were probably seeing what was happening, and then there were some in the middle, and then, you know, some pretty late. And, and Venezuelans continued very bravely, I would say. Yes. Yeah. So I applaud that. Yeah, the Cubans staged a revolt. Thousands of Cubans died in the mountains fighting, and they were small farmers. They were not, you know, the elite in Cuba. This is very complex. We're not going to, you know, answer it. I do want to give Beatriz a chance because I think she is Venezuelan and she can talk about that. But to go to your second question before Beatriz um, can speak, I don't want to digress into the U.S. and whatever because we're going to go out of, you know, on a tangent. But I do want to point that there's some scholars talking about cultural Marxism and how it's affecting our society. And I do quote in the book this fascinating uh, video. Actually, there's several videos by a um, defector or dis 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 deserter from the KGB in the late 1970s, Judy Besmanoff. Look it up in the bibliography. And if you go into YouTube and you see his videos, it talks about how the Soviet Union, since the end of the uh, World War, started to influence U.S. academia and society with the generational process in mind that Fidel talks about in, you know, that Baikapuro Lameda talks about. And I think it's really fascinating to listen to that and see what we see a lot in, in America. You want to... So I just wanted to add to your brilliant analysis two, two structural traces of the Latin American countries, which Venezuela shares with every single Latin American country, and this is why they are so vulnerable to these kind of strategies as the one that developed over the years by Fidel Castro. Uh, one is that uh, our Latin American societies are, are rent structured. They are not, they are, economic systems that were not built to create wealth, but to extract rent. Mm -hmm. When you have a rent extracting society in a state of wealth creating society, what you have is a dependence 
of most of this society on the political play of the elites. And because of that, then you really have like two countries. You have the elites that are modern, um, global, uh, they have, um, a, they, they have a, cult, a middle class culture, and then you have the backward society, which is people that thrive in the, you know, from the, 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 they escape from poverty, uh, they're trying to escape from poverty, they they're live mostly in subsistence levels. And the brilliance of the strategy is that you, what you do, do to the elites, you can easily buy loyalty. For example, in the case of Venezuela, very many of the business community supported Chavez and supported the whole system. Why? Because when Chavez decided to set up the, 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 the price control and the exchange control, uh, everybody thought, okay, now if I behave well and I please him, I'm going to be allowed to, to charge the prices that I need to charge in order to make a profit and I'm going to have access to cheap foreign exchange. Um, and that was the way they bought the loyalty of the business community in Venezuela. Um, of the poor, they bought it with the missions. Uh, one of the things that I remember telling everybody in Venezuela, when Chavez launched the, 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 the famous missions, the one, the one with the with the doctors, the, 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 you know, for health care, media health care for the population, I was called Barrio Adentro, was do not publicly, you, what you need to do right now is to use the, the, the judicial system that at that time was independent or semi-independent to get some, some um, measures to protect, so to impede that they, that they take over without making any political statements against mm -hmm. the program. Why? Because these are people that have never seen a doctor in their slums. Mm -hmm. And now they're seeing doctors that are in their slums, and so if they don't care if the doctors are Chinese or they are Martians. They have a doctor there, because what used to happen before? If a little, if a boy had caught himself a um, a, a, a finger, they will have to take him down, sorry, down the, the mountain, you know, all the, the neighbors collaborating, and then they will have no need to get a car, and then get, get into the hospital by the time uh, this, the, 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 the wound would have been infected, the guy, the, and the... And what they did very cleverly was to put these this Cuban doctors there that could take care of these, these events. So... Uh, the, what you needed to to to, uh, was to ask the the, the 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 courts to restrain in orders because these people, according to the law of Venezuela, could not practice medicine because their degrees were not valid in Venezuela. Thank you. Let's not get into that because we have a whole project on yes. medical missions, and it's and I, there's a section on the book that addresses that issue. But this is, you know, when you think about the psychology of, of people, these, these things are well thought out. They're not like random. And that's how this is being done. And when you look at Chile, it's the opposite. Chile has the highest social mobility and the highest rates. And look at what's happening in Chile. And we're not going to get into that, but this is well thought out to take over countries. This is not a random sort of um, thing, oh, you know, let's see what happens. Any questions? I, first of all, I would like to repeat what I'm not even going to go there here. The <laughs> words, I'm sure that you put on a lot of hard work in there and it's a wonderful work. Thank you. It's one word that I remember. Uh, and I think it's, I think it, uh, it's, an, it's important to realize Yeah. 
Well, I was born in Cuba, but left when I was eight months old. I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm Cuban, Venezuelan, Chilean, Puerto Rican, American. I know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. This is a, a, I mean, the, the, the chapter on Cuba's core competency would be, if I had the time, I didn't even have time for this book, if I had the time, it would be my next book. Because that is the way that Cuba has made inroads, not just in the region, all over the world. You know, according to the testimony of defectors from Cuban intelligence, there's around 5,000 relationships of influence in the United States by Cuba. This little, you know, country has one of the best intelligence services in the world, formed by the KGB, trained by the KGB. You know, there's, I've, I've looked into this for many, many years. You know, I've visited, you know, the former um, uh, headquarters of the Stasi, the Czech police, how they work. I mean, it's a fascinating way that Cuba has developed this, but blackmail is one of their singular, you know, tools. And I give some examples in the book. Um, I don't know, I think I do give this example in the book. It's cited how, uh, I think it was Correa, Rafael Correa's. No, no, this is Venezuela. Chavez was naming closet homosexuals in high uh, offices because, of course, the, they have a dossier of intelligence on you. So this is a way to buy your loyalty if they know that you have a second, you know, a secret life and you're married and have kids, then they pull it out. This is, I think I do cite it in the book, but there's so many examples of this. And that's why, you know, that's why I say, I mean, they're not restrained. They don't have the normal restraints that we have in, you know, even in the weakest democracies. In, the, in this country, I mean, I've had to do with Washington and different parts of the government to do anything, any, they have to consult with 20 lawyers. You know, the Defense Department, the State Department, you know, they, ha they, they have to submit to elections, they have media. I mean, it's like Cuba doesn't have any of that. Imagine for 60 years you have all the resources to do whatever you want. And I, that chapter is really important because it talks about why Cuba is so powerful in the UN. You know, why it has deployed, you know, the support system in international organizations and how they have bought their way through power and influence in those bodies. And that translates to Venezuela. And some Venezuelans have talked about how the Venezuelans were telling them, the government Venezuelans were telling them, the Cubans are telling us to be patient, that eventually we're going to get to the level that Cuba got, which is total impunity. Yes, Fernando. Thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, quick question, though. In terms of jurisdictions, can we speculate the next jurisdictions will be Colombia, Spain, and ultimately the United States? We're not getting into politics, of course. But uh, can we speculate on this? Well, in the book, I don't speculate. In the book, I added sections on Colombia and Mexico. Very briefly on Mexico. There, they, Colombia has been a target, um, and I get into it, and that's why I wrote the chapter on Norway. It's really important. Um, it's on the verge. I think 
I'm very, very concerned about Chile and what's going on there. And it's really, really surprising when you ask your question, what about the elites? How did they let this happen? I'm following Chile on a daily basis, and I want to cry when I see what's going on there. I mean, the government has doesn't know how to deal with it, to put it kindly. I think also the media has been infiltrated by this narrative, and in the case of Chile, for example, I think the guilt trip with the dictatorship didn't allow for a proper narrative that put the Allende government and the whole Pinochet regime in context with the history, because Cuba had a role. Cuba was going to take over Chile, and that's why you had a coup. And then sadly, a dictatorship came in that committed crimes against the people, et cetera, et cetera. So I, you know, I don't want to get into the U.S. and Spain, but clearly what's happening in Spain is connected because Podemos is connected. I mean, that's proven. That's not speculation. I like to use data, not, you know, but when you read the tea leaves, it's frightening. Manny. Yes, the, uh, the The material I do have is a long, extensive library on Cuba. That's what I know a little bit about. And when you look at Fidel Castro and what he was able to do in Cuba and the manipulation of the masses, Fidel Castro was a study, a, a, a student of Hitler, Stalin, you know, a student of Gramsci, of history. So I think, you know, it's human nature. When you look at, for example, if you tell people, you know, look what happened in Cuba, they would say, es la revolución del callo. So what does that mean? Until they stepped on your toes, you were with the regime. But when it was against your neighbor because they had two cars and you had one or you had a better house or whatever, that's very dangerous. You know, it's human nature. I think the only antidote to that is information. And it, nowadays, I, you know, my son calls me all the time and says, but... You know, the problem with today's, you know, mediums is like you don't know, you know, you have so much information, you're inundated, and what is fake news and what is not? I mean, there are big challenges there. So I, and I, and I tell him, well, all I can do is I try to balance out. You know, I read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, National Review to get an idea. Imagine even trying to find, to, to follow our country and have some balance. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. But I think this material is very important because we see what happened in those societies. And that is a real, an imminent threat. It's not a speculation. We're seeing the results. 
of what happened in Cuba and what happened in Venezuela and what can happen in the region and in the world. And then you have nefarious actors like Russia. I mean, you know what? It's funny for me that people are so concerned all of a sudden about Russia when Russia has been doing this for decades. I mean, all you had is, you know, so now it's not called communist. But you have essentially pretty much the same, you know, the KGB was restructured with a different name, the same tactics, the same agents, you know, the same training pretty much. And, you know, people are rightly so concerned with Russia. But this is not new and it's not novel. They've been interfering. Not just, you know, I suggest, for example, in the bibliography are the Mitrokin archives. There's, uh, Mitrokin was a, the chief archivist of the KGB who left with two containers of information and was uh, taken out to, to the UK. And that archive is available in Cambridge, but it has been put into two books, into two volumes about the work of the KGB. And one of the volumes is the work of the KGB in the third world and mostly in Latin America through its proxy Cuba. They've been using these tactics forever. But, you know, for some reason, they're so successful that when we talk about, you know, the 70s and the 80s in Latin America, people are talking about the bad CIA that was doing this. And no, the, there was a Cold War, and the KGB was actively trying to bring communism to the region. So information is really important. That's, you know, at least the way I can contribute to put my little, you know, grain of sand. Our hostess has a question. Thank you. Okay, so I quote Guaido in the sense of what he said and the Venezuelan leadership has said about Cuba's intervention. So that you can see in sight. I have a hard enough time trying to understand the Cuban opposition to even pretend to understand the very complex, you know, makeup actors of the Venezuelan opposition. I hear this, I hear that. I'd rather not get into it, but I do want to say and end this in a positive note. We should never lose hope. Never. And we should never stop fighting for the truth and for freedom. Um, so that's why, you know, we have, this is our little contribution to this. And always, you know, and I say, look, in the Cuban issue, who knows what could happen? I don't do this for myself or to go back to Cuba or whatever. I do this because this is the right thing to do and somebody has to do it. And if we, the Venezuelans or the Cubans or whoever says, oh no, let somebody else do it, then who's going to fight for truth, freedom, justice? Look at the suffering. Because look, I was thinking about this today and I'll end with this because this has gone long enough. And I was thinking this is a challenge for a little outfit like ours because we try to add value with information, facts that can be cited, that can help. But this is not about facts. It's not about numbers. It's about real people that are suffering, people who don't have to eat. I mean, this is the story. I get, I get up in the morning, and I do two hours of news from Cuba, Venezuela, whatever. And this is the story you see every day. You know, people who don't have basic fundamental freedoms as well as basic necessities of life that are suffering horrible injustices. So this is why 
this is important and not just from the point of view, you know, of elevated, you know, discourses on political science or Gramsci or whatever. Of course, you need to understand it. But this is about people and we should never lose hope on our people. So thank you very much for coming. And so I'll be happy to sign some books if you want to buy some, if you want to buy the $5 ones with the wrong cover but the right uh, content, give it to your friends. I appreciate that. Thank you very much for Juni and for coming. <laughs>